everybody welcome back to my channel my name is Rebecca I just want to give you an update on what I've been doing uh, for the last few weeks I've been traveling all over New York State going down to the city going out west um, going up north so uh, I've been taking a lot of video and it's taking me a while to edit because also working full-time job so uh, for right now, I'm just going to show you the Q&A uh, from the Star Trek experience event I went to with William Shatner. Um, not much of William Shatner's Q&A, but the Q&A from James Colley, the owner and creator of the uh, Ticonderoga Star Trek tour. So um, he's going to tell a lot of amazing stories a lot of updates to the experience so uh, it's a long time coming but I'm finally putting this video up and I hope you enjoy if you want to see uh, more of my travels please like and subscribe and I will be back with all my New York adventures so thanks for watching and I'll see you later so we're in the high school in Ticonderoga and, oh yeah, a whole bunch of people. <laughs> I got up at 7 o'clock this morning to get on a boat to go down to uh, Bill Shatner's hotel and then ride a boat back with him at 70 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> no hairspray in the world survives that. <laughs> Without further ado, if you don't mind, why don't I just open it up to a couple of questions. Tony, does this mic work? Yes, sir. Can we put it down there, Stoge, so I can hear people when they ask a question? Why Ticonderoga? Well, that's a good question. Uh, Ticonderoga because I was born here, uh, I grew up here, went to school in this building, oh, wow. and I, I graduated. Uh, yeah, thank you. And I graduated from, from Ticonderoga High School, and in 1986, I was such a Trekkie. Uh, the kids in school really, you know, in those days, if you were a, a Star Trek fan or a Star Wars fan or a superhero fan, you were kind of beat up on and ostracized and all this yep. kind of So I was never into sports. I was the Trekkie that everybody knew. Nope. So when I graduated from high school, uh, the end of, middle of 1986, I guess I'd been out of school for almost a year. I, I was one of those kind of fearless nerds. I didn't care if they beat me up. I didn't think about too much other than I liked this thing. So I picked up the telephone and I called 213-956-5000, uh, which was the switchboard of Paramount Pictures. And I asked for the Star Trek costume designer, and I mispronounced his name. I said, William Ware uh, Theus. And the operator said, oh, you mean Bill Tice? Sure. I said, sure. Yes. <laughs> so she connected the call, and Mr. Tice answered the phone. And that was the, the phone call that changed the direction of my life. Uh, we became friends over the phone. Um, you know, like phone pen pals kind of thing in those days. There was no internet. And I was talking to him all the time about the costumes, the uniforms from the original show. I wanted to know everything about it. I wanted to know what the fabrics were. I wanted to know where to get them. How did they make the braid on the sleeves? Where did they get the badges? How did you do that? And he was kind of mesmerized by this 18-year-old kid who was like a sponge for something that he thought was just this throwaway thing. He never understood the fascination with the Starfleet uniform. He never understood it. But he took a, a, a liking to me, and about six or seven months after that phone call, uh, I called the studio one day just to chat with him for a minute about some questions I had, and he said, hey, we are getting ready to make a new Star Trek television show, and I'm doing the costumes again. Why don't you come out and do some work for me? Wow. Are you so into this? Oh. So. <laughs> just, yeah. <laughs> I was quite shocked. You know, and uh, so I, I went to California, and I was out there for uh, 13 or 14 months the first time, and I made all of uh, Wesley Crusher's sweaters. Wow. 
Oh. The rainbow yeah. one? <laughs> the rainbow. Don't hate me, I always The rainbow one. one. <laughs> but the fun thing about that was that at that time, I had a 28-inch waist, and I could make it and put it on me, and then they could put it in Will Wheaton's dressing room. So we were virtually interchangeable at that particular moment in time. And as fate would have it, um, another friend of mine who lived out on the West Coast uh, called me and said, hey man, you are this ridiculous Elvis fan. They knew I loved his music. And there was a, an audition happening and you should go. So I went uh, and I did this audition, which led me to Memphis. Mm. Uh, and I ended up, uh, two years in a row, I competed. And that was back in the days when Elvis's uh, cohorts, his, his bodyguards and his musicians were, were the judges. And I won uh, the nationals uh, and became the number one Elvis impersonator in 1992. <laughs> uh, so that led me to no longer want to be in a uh, 12 by 24 room 12 hours a day sewing clothes. Uh, when I could walk out on stage and have women scream and laugh and love it and, and people just begging you to do another song, you know, I kind of got bit by that being on the stage thing. So here I am, 31 years later, I've tried to retire from it twice and I just can't seem to stop. So I'm, I'm still doing, that's my, my main job. So unfortunately COVID has kind of stopped me for the last year but it, it, it made me realize that uh, it's harder to stop when you're told you can't do it versus your own decision to not do it right with anything i think really uh, had me uh, upset that my freedom was gone and my, my freedom to make a choice so uh, get off your asses and get vaccinated <laughs> I don't want to preach, but you know, which right piece? Follow the damn science. It's not. Right? I think everybody in this room can agree that politicians are jerks. Yeah. I don't care if you're a Democrat. Woo! Uh, I'd like to see us all forget about that and realize that we are students of one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century, and his name was Gene Roddenberry. <laughs> Now granted, Gene didn't realize so much how he was affecting people and he was doing it to get a paycheck. But what, what he created and what he stood for and what he still stands for today means a lot to us or we wouldn't be sitting here today. So it's our job to walk the walk, talk the talk, and educate the people out there who don't get it. Right? Gene said it doesn't matter what color we are, how many legs we have, how many ears we have. We're smarter and we're better than all of that because we are people. We're human beings. It's <laughs> That's my pontification for the day. Sorry. Anyway, let me let me ask you guys if you have other questions. Okay, well, you were, uh, you went to the audition to portray Elvis. Mm -hmm. So I was curious how long you worked on that part of the audition. That's a good question. I really hadn't been. When I was in high school, I got a part-time job at the local FM radio station that we had, and it was one of those um, Hot 100 stations, so they were playing all the contemporary stuff. They were playing, you know, Men at Work and all that 80s Duran Duran, Guns N' Roses music. And uh, I, I started doing the 6 p.m. to midnight shift, so I had to follow the playlist religiously or get, get in trouble with the station management. And then I, I asked them, I said, look, can I have would I have more freedom if I moved from midnight to six? And they said, well, hell, nobody listens from midnight to six. So if you want that, you, you can have that, and you can pretty much add whatever you wanted. So little did they know, there were people listening from midnight to six. The people that were working the, the overnight shifts at the paper company, I, I would play Elvis music. So this went on for a couple of weeks, and the lady that sold radio advertising came in, because she'd heard it. And she said, hey, we have a, a, a guy that wants to do a, a, a goofy ad, 
and he wants it to be in Elvis' voice, mm -hmm. can you do it? I said, yeah. I mean, I had never really done it before, so I, I did this thing where I was talking like Elvis and did this commercial, and they put Elvis' music behind it, you know, with the real Elvis singing, and I was, you know, selling uh, uh, radial tires for the, the sport shop as Elvis, and the thing went on the air, and 6 a.m. in the morning, my father uh, picked me up from work to go to breakfast, and the spot played on the radio. Now, my father was a huge Elvis guy. He was uh, in the army, stationed in Germany, and he was an MP, so he saw Elvis and was like, wow. God's in the room. So the, the ad came on the radio, and I turned it up, and I said, yeah, that's me, Dad, that's me. And he listened to me and said, yeah, that's not you. <laughs> so I had a hard time convincing him that I had done the commercial, but eventually, you know, he, he, he came to realize it was me, and that was that part of the story. Do the ad! Yes. Do the ad! Yeah. Do the Let's ad! Do it! <laughs> there, was a, there was a caricature about Elvis that people have in their minds today that uh, I don't know where it came from. A lot of, a lot of guys do this, huh, 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 garbage, right? <laughs> That's not Elvis. Uh, Elvis recorded a song called Walk a Mile in My Shoes. Has anybody heard that? When he would perform that song, he, he had a speech that he would say uh, before the song started. I don't know how many of you people, are you Elvis fans? Some. Well, he, Elvis was a very soft-spoken dude, man. He wasn't doing this, <laughs> I don't know where that came from. But anyway, uh, let's see if I can clear my mind and do this right for you. In my best Elvis voice. I'm not going to sing, but I'll talk. So there's a guy who said one time, Ooh. she never stood in that man's shoes. I saw things through his eyes. I stood and watched with helpless hands while the heart inside it dies. So help your brother along the way, no matter where he starts. But the same God that made you made him too. All these men with broken hearts. I'd like to sing a song along the same line. You said you can speak for Darren. Uh, he's I pretty much can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's working on the director's edition uh, motion picture, right? 4K? Yes, he is. Yeah, I love that movie. Great movie. Yeah. Uh, great visuals. Uh, but there's some matting issues. There's some dust in the lens. There's, you know, it's it's a product of its time. It's a very esoteric question. But, like, do you know if they're really going to make it perfect? Like, get rid of all those specs? Make okay. like Just make it the way it should be, I guess. Here's what I can tell you. I've known Darren Dockerman for many, many years, and I call him my brother from another mother. Star Trek, the motion picture, is the most important movie in the franchise to Darren Dockerman. He was handpicked by Robert Wise and, and uh, David Fine a few years ago when Robert Wise was brought back in to do his real cut of the movie, because in 1979, Robert Wise was never given the time to do a director's cut. Did you know that? He never had fine. He, in his contract, he had final cut, but because they were so far behind, he never got a final cut. So Darren got to work with him in doing the, the final cut of the film. And for the last, I don't know, 15 years or so since that DVD came out, Darren and uh, David Fine and Mike Matasino had been fighting, pushing Paramount <gasps> weekly all these years to get this done. And I know that they're gonna do a completely new transfer of the film for them to work on, and then they are taking everything that they did all those years ago when they when they redid those special effects, they have all their storyboards and so forth, so they're completely starting from scratch and redoing all of those special effects in the highest resolution humanly possible, which means film, film stock, okay? And it's supposed to premiere on Paramount Plus first, and then I know it's going to 4K. A home video for everybody, and he he has said to me on the on the slide, wait till you see the special features. So I hope that answers your question. That's really great. You guys gotta watch it. Okay. Yep. And I'll get you. Okay.
Okay. Um, I heard you're working on the next generation set. How is that going? It's going. Uh, <laughs> one of the, the biggest hang-ups that we've had is COVID. Okay. Uh, if you are standing in the Star Trek parking lot and you're looking at the front of the Star Trek building, to your right there is a gray wall a building. That's the building that we are uh, working to acquire. The building um, has technically sat vacant for I don't know how many years. I think it's the taxes, I think, were delinquent about 12 years. So uh, we struck a deal with the Essex County, New York, to buy the building for uh, the back taxes, which means they have to foreclose on the, mm -hmm. on, the, on the building. And then COVID hit, and Governor Cuomo put a non-foreclosure order across the board. Yeah. So if you're out of work, you're, and you can't pay your rent, your landlord can't evict you. Well, it was such a broad order that it even stopped uh, yeah. tax foreclosure. So they have my money sitting in a, in a bank account. Mm. So all the work on the building stopped. But that didn't mean, you know, we entirely stopped. We've been building set pieces uh, in the back of the Star Trek tour and in the green uh, uh, barn looking building on the other side. Mm. Uh, and CBS um, gave us a bunch of uh, parts that were in storage that they found that they that they gave us so right now we've been working on the bridge of the enterprise d yeah yeah and uh, <laughs> if you're if you're sitting in picard's chair and you get up and turn around to talk to Worf, we've already built the entire uh bank Real. of computers Ooh. they're all built they all have um television screens in them, they're all computer controlled. We uh, have the forward ops panels built. We have the cards chair ready. We're starting on Worf's tactical railing. Mm. Uh, so we're moving along slower than I would like, but the plan is to do the exact same thing with Star Trek The Next Generation that we have done with the original series. So Great. at some point when you, when you come to visit, you will walk through the corridors of the D and go into the ready room and see the bridge and oh. the conference room. And uh, when you get to engineering, our plan is since, it, since the building is two stories, uh, the, the ground, the bottom actually is set into the ground of that building, and then there's a, yeah. a back piece that's above, it's second story. Our plan is to have the warp core come up into the gift shop. <laughs> so the second story of engineering will be the gift shop. And down the warp court, people taking the tour. Oh, the hell. So that's kind of what we're thinking. And um, mm. I, I tried to announce today while everybody was in line uh, for their photo ops, uh, we opened six years ago, um, thankfully, and every August we have held an event called Trek on mm -hmm. How many of you have been to Trek on One or two? It's, it's a lot of fun. We, we, we try to be like an old fashioned convention. We're not like, you know, creation and all that. And uh, the Shacker thing is kind of different because it's one man. And as you can see by looking at the schedule, he has to do so many VIP tours, which kind of stretches things out, which is why we say read the schedule. You can tour on the, if you do a general admission, you got these hours. If you got a VIP, you got these hours. So it's, it's a little different. But Trek on Aroga, the set is open all day, almost 14 hours a day. You just keep going. And then the celebrities are doing things up here and they're doing things on the sets. So it's a whole different. But uh, I'm talking about this because you know, uh, last year we didn't get to do it because of COVID. This year we're coming back better than ever. And we're going to do it in September, the weekend of September 24th, 25th, 26th, whatever that weekend is. And George Takei just signed his contract. So, Although George, is, uh, George is, was in one of my fan films years ago, George has never been to this facility. He's never seen all the sets yeah. together since 1969. So he's very eager to come and lead tours. Uh, he wants to have a, 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 a big party, a, a George party, an oh my gathering. <laughs> would, yeah. <laughs> and have, have a lot of fun with the fans. And if you've ever met George, you know you're in for a while time. He's, he's a lot of fun. And the best couple of things is that George is also going to have a couple of friends with him, and they are Brent Spiner and Gates McFadden. 
So they're also going to do their own. They're going to they're going to be together. The Doctor and the Android doing tours of the classic Enterprise, like it's a holodeck, with fans. And um, so we're, we're really excited. Tickets are going to go on sale in the studio tomorrow. There'll be some different levels that you can do, or you can just get a general admission and add on what you want later on. There's no there's no crazy rush or what have you, but it's it's a very intimate, fun time. All three of them are going to go play miniature golf with the fans. We sell a ticket. It's funny. We did it with Robin That's Curtis, and every time oh she missed, God. she would yell out, Savick sucks. <laughs> so we, we have a lot of fun with these guys. So uh, if you can make it, we'd love to have you. I think you'll have a good time. What got you into Star Trek? What's, what got me into Star Trek? The very first episode I ever saw was Shore Leave. As a kid. It's fair. It's fair. And I absolutely loved the fact that they were on a planet and they were getting into all kinds of trouble. And there was, you know, the captain was beating up on this guy and there was a rabbit and a samurai. That was the first one I ever saw as a kid. I was probably younger than you. But it was on every night, twice a night on WPIX out of New York City. And uh, it's. What? Theodore Sturgeon. Absolutely. That was the first thing I ever saw. And so as a kid, it was like watching Batman. As a kid, you saw all the adventure and the fun and all that. You didn't realize there was something else going on, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't realize there was all these messages. And I kept watching it. And as I got older, I started to see all these other messages about where we're going to go if we work together. It doesn't matter what color we are or who we're in love with and all these things. And I said, you know, it'd be a pretty great place to live. How do I get there? <laughs> so Star Trek, that's that's how I got into Star Trek. I started watching it on television. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for pursuing such kind of a crazy vision about putting the Enterprise in Tycoon. <laughs> and then we can all sit, it was so amazing to sit on the bridge of the Enterprise. Well, thank you. I'll tell you a little bit about American history and the Enterprise. Um, Ticonderoga is very rich in American history. We were the reason that we won the American Revolution. Our cannon were taken uh, by Henry Knox down to Washington to defeat the British. They, would, they pulled them by oxen from Ticonderoga all the way down to, to, to attack the British. Can you imagine doing that in the dead of winter? Mm. Why am I telling you this? Because uh, the traitor, uh, Benedict Arnold, uh, he started the first uh, U.S. Navy uh, in this area, and they built several ships. And one of those ships was named, guess what? The Enterprise. Enterprise. Did you know that? Yeah. No. And it's, it, it's, it, it got damaged, heavily damaged in the Battle of Valcour Islands during the American Revolution, and, and made it down to Lake Champlain near Fort Ticonderoga and sank. Oh. So the first... American naval vessel named Enterprise sits in the waters of Lake Champlain just outside of Fort Ticonderoga. Wow. wow. Right? Okay. Pretty cool. So it's not such a far stretch to think that the USS Enterprise uh, from the 23rd century shouldn't have some sort of spot. <laughs> Here. I'll tell you That's another funny cool. story. You want another six degrees of separation Kevin Bacon stuff? <laughs> You're going to love this. <laughs> true story. Both. What I'm going to tell you, true story. My math teacher, his name was H. G. Burley, and his homeroom is down that hallroom <laughs> to the right. He was my math teacher. Wonderful guy. I was terrible at math, and I was afraid of him at first. He was very, he had a very bombastic voice, and, and uh, he kind of intimidated me. And I came to school one afternoon not really wanting to be in math class. And I set my books down on my desk. He gave us the lesson that we had to, to, to go through and do. And he would walk around in between the desks, you know, kind of watch you and make sure you were doing what you were supposed to be doing. And as he walked by my desk, he looked over, and on the desk in my books was the Star Trek Compendium <laughs> by Alan Asherman. And he picked up the book. He said, oh, you like Star Trek? I said, yes, sir. yeah, I do. He said, you know, my best friend was in that television show. I said, really? 
said, yeah, he grew up in Ticonderoga. Did you know that? I said, I had no idea. What are you, what are you talking about? So now everybody stops their mass work. <laughs> and he said, yeah, yeah. There was an episode with Captain Kirk, and he's on this weird planet, and my buddy was wearing this ridiculous blonde wig, and he was playing Captain Kirk's best friend, and he got bit by a, a white monkey. Oh. <laughs> Tyree. Yeah. Well, yeah. Tyree, I guess that was the character. He said, but well, my friend's name was Michael Whitney. He said, did you know that his real name was Whitney Armstrong, and that he grew up in Ticonderoga, and he, we both graduated from this school? Wow. That shocked me. So Michael Whitney, the actor, married Twiggy. Mm -hmm. famous yeah. Actor. And uh, I never did get to meet him before he passed away, but he, he grew up here in Ticonderoga. He was from Ticonderoga. Now it gets better. It gets much better. Jeez. I had three favorite television shows when I was a kid. Star Trek, Batman, mm -hmm. and The Wild Wild West. With Robert yeah. So, in 1998, mm -hmm. I came home from touring as Elvis, and there was an entertainment auction. Not quite like the ones they do today, because it was it was everything, you know. And, and so I'm looking at the catalog, and there's no internet, for God's sakes. And you have to call in and bid by phone, or you have to be there in person with a paddle. So I called up and I registered, and did all this stuff. And the woman said, make sure you're on the phone by such and such time, so we have time to get your lot on first and go through all this, do whatever it is you want to bid on. Yeah, okay, okay. So I'm, I'm registering in the auction because they have two of Robert Conrad's outfits from the Wild Wild West. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and I want to buy them, <laughs> thinking that I'm going to be bidding against nobody because I'm a, you know, a young guy who doesn't really know the world too much. And I got on the phone, and the lots come up, and the bidding starts. So I start bidding, and somebody's bidding against me because it keeps going up, and it keeps going up, and the woman says, do you want it? I'm like, yes, yes, yes. So the bidding gets up to $57, $5,800, whatever it was, and the other bidder stops. And I said, take it, buy it. So the hammer fell, and I got the stuff. Oh, I was up to cloud nine. So the auction's done, they take all the information, they, they've got my credit card, the whole nine yards, and they, they ship me the stuff. I didn't have the stuff two days. 10 o'clock at night, I'm laying in bed, watching, of all things, Beverly Hills 902 and all. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else on television. The phone rings, and I reach over and I grab the phone, and I say, hello, James, yes, Says Robert Conrad, what are you doing with my clothes? <laughs> I froze because it was him. <laughs> and I'm going, I'm covering the phone and I'm yelling to my mother, pick up the phone, pick up the phone. <laughs> so we have this conversation and he's like, uh, so you have some of my outfits. I said, yeah, I just bought them at auction. He says, yeah, I know. You were bidding against me. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I don't really know what I was bidding against. I, yeah, I got your number from the auction house. And they weren't going to give it to me. Then they realized it was me, and I got the number. And so I'm calling you because, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit older now, and I've got two little kids, second marriage. I've got two kids, and we watch Wild Wild West every day on TNT. And I don't, it's the only thing I worked on that I don't have a piece of. Mm. I don't have anything to, you know, to say to the kids, hey, look, this, this is Dad's. He said, would you sell me one? And without missing a beat, I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Dead silence. <laughs> the other end of the phone. And so he finally, he said, well, why? And I said, look, I'm not going to sell you one. I will give you one Aww. on one condition. He said, well, what's that? That I fly to California and I hand it to you personally. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely, he said. So we made arrangements. He said, look, James, I'm going to be at a restaurant on Sunset Boulevard called the Captain of Fiddle. And it just so happens in three weeks, we're having an anniversary, the 25th anniversary dinner of the Wild Wild West. 
this will be all these people that worked on the show there. Why don't you come out and you can give it to me there and you can stay for the dinner. I was on cloud nine. Right? Yeah. So, I've got the date, I'm gonna go, I've got my plane tickets. The night before, okay, I'm flying out on Saturday night, Saturday morning, Saturday morning. Friday night, the night before, I am on stage at the, uh, what do they call it now? Uh, it's in Albany, New York. Uh, Times Union. No, Palace. Palace. The palace. palace. Is it still there? Yep. Okay, so I was on stage at the Palace Theater and I had Elvis's backup singers, the Jordanaires, and I had his drummer, DJ Montana, with the whole, you know, I was with his whole people doing Elvis in concert. And the only thing that was going through my mind is let's get this over with so I can go make a comeback. <laughs> so when the show was over, we were required by the producers to be in the lobby doing a meet and greet with people as they were coming out and signing autographs for everybody. And that takes like an extra hour and a half. You can't just leave and it angers the promoter, so you have to do it. And the whole time I'm going, oh my God, I'm going to see Robert Conrad. <laughs> I gotta get out of here. So we finish up, I literally pack everything up and I go down to the, the turf inn in Albany and I slept there to get to, get to the airport in the morning. I get on the plane, fly to California, and I had an old friend, uh, Mark, are you here? Strzok, are you here? He's not here. So this, he's been a friend of mine for 40 years, and uh, he's, he uh, used to you know, make sure I got him on and off the stage and all the shows and all these things. And so I said, you and two of the guys you're going with me, I'm gonna buy the tickets, we're flying to California. We're gonna see Robert Conrad. So we get out there. Now why, you're going, where is this going, right? How does this, go? trust me. We're gonna get back to Ticonderoga very quickly. <laughs> so I fly to California, we land. I've got an hour and 10 minutes to get from LAX to Sunset Boulevard, and if any of you guys know the traffic, yeah. that yeah. could be a problem. But we made it, and we get to the restaurant, and I walk in, and this lady comes over with a clipboard and everything, and she takes my name, and she's the organizer of the thing, and she scrolls down, and she's, oh, oh, you're James, oh, I so sorry, Bob Conrad's not here tonight. Wait, what? Uh, <sighs> I was so upset. She said, but there's a lot of other people from, from uh, this, the show that are here, so you know, relax, have a great dinner, make the best of it, I'm gonna introduce you to a bunch of people. She doesn't tell me why Bob Conrad's not there. So we walk over, my, me and my guys, and we sit at this table, and off, kind of behind me to the right, is the restroom doors, and in front of that is this big oval table with an elderly gentleman who was probably, you know, in his late 60s with snow white hair and big black rimmed glasses and a, and a, a rather elegantly dressed older lady and a younger couple across the table from them. And we walk in and we sit down. From the time I walked in, this guy is burning daggers through staring at me, watching me, and then he looks at the older lady and the younger people, he's going, <laughs> <laughs> and he goes back to them and he keeps doing this. And this is going on. I mean, it went on for a good 20, 25 minutes. And you know what it is when people, somebody's staring at you after a while and you're like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> and then I, I thought, oh, it's got to be my hair. I look like Elvis. Right? I didn't think anything more about it. And then the guy gets up from his chair and he's like trying to covertly... <laughs> <laughs> Look at, the, look at me at the table, and he goes back and he's talking to these people again. Now, by this point, the organizer hasn't come back, and I've got to use the men's room, which means I've got to get up and walk right by this guy and his table. And he's, it's really unnerving. So I look at my buddies and I say, look guys, I'm gonna go use the restroom. If this guy does anything crazy, you better back me up. <laughs> so I get up, and I walk to the restroom, and I pass right by him, and he does this. <laughs> but he never did anything else. So I went to the bathroom and I thought, okay, there's not going to be any problem. So I go about my business, I come out, and I don't look at him. And as I pass the table, the next thing I feel is this hand on my shoulder. And I turn around and I went, <laughs> and he goes, no! <laughs> no! I know you! I said, no, sir, no, you don't. In fact, you're upsetting me. 
sitting and staring at me for half an hour. What is the problem? No, I'm telling you, I know you. Look, you're really upsetting me. And then by this time, my guys are over there and we're ready for a fight. You know? <laughs> he says, look, I'm telling you, don't you know me? I said, no, sir, I don't know you. He said, I played Elvis's brother in the movie Love Me Tender. And I froze and I said, oh, I'm sorry. I said, I, I haven't seen many of Elvis's movies at this point. I, said, you know, I, I really love his music, but I haven't watched the movies. And to this day, I cannot tell you what his answer was, because when he spoke next, I went, oh my God, you're Trelane from Star Trek. <laughs> and he said, yes. <laughs> Hello. He said, yes, I am. And uh, I said, oh my God. <laughs> he said, yes, and I know, it gets better, he goes, and yes, I know you. You did an Elvis show in Albany, New York last night. Oh. <laughs> and now I'm white. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, I did. I know! We were there! <laughs> I've been trying to tell my wife and son-in-law that it was you. What are the odds of that? <laughs> he said, we were in Albany, we were doing this and that, and we went to the show, and I wanted to catch you, and I wanted to tell you how good it was, but I had to catch a plane, and I had to get back to L.A. I said, so did I. <laughs> <laughs> so we visited for quite a while, struck up this great little friendship, and exchanged numbers, and then the organizer of the event came over, and she said, you know, there's a lot of people you should get up and meet. Let me show you around. So she, this is where the Kevin Bacon thing comes in again. One night, she walks me over to another table. She introduces this older man, beautiful young girl. So my mind kicks into high hero. This is one of those Hollywood guys. <laughs> Got the young girl on his arm. And she says, James, this is David. David, this is James. And then somebody yells her name and she walks away. Who the hell is David? <laughs> so we start talking, and I brought up something about upstate New York. And he said, really? He said, so where are you from uh, in upstate New York? And I said, oh, you've never heard of it. Uh, I said, unless you buy pencils. <laughs> <laughs> so then he got this weird look on his face. And he said, no, 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 where are you from in upstate New York? I said, oh, it's this little hole in the woods called Ticonderoga. And he stared me in the face and he said, uh, what would you say if I told you that I was from Ticonderoga? <laughs> I could have swore Rod Surly was in the room. I said, you're lying. You're an absolute liar. You're not from Ticonderoga. He said, do you know Virginia Burley? Now I'm in trouble. Virginia Burley was my librarian. Her brother was my math teacher, H.G. Burley. <laughs> Now I know this man is for real. He's a real, this is the real deal. Oh he knows like on a road. I said, oh my God. I said, what is your last name? He said, my name's David Mosinger. This is my daughter. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You have a brother named John. He said, yeah. I said, I know. He works with my grandfather at International Paper. <laughs> so when I was a senior in high school, you were the executive producer of the television series Quincy. Yes, I was. I know, because I wanted to get into show business, and my grandfather, we were trying to contact you through your brother, but it didn't work, and, then, and now I'm, I said, this is nuts. I came out here to meet Robert Conrad. I've met Trelane from Star Trek. <laughs> and he said, Star Trek? You like Star Trek? I said, well, you have no idea. <laughs> so he laughed, and he said, well, then you must know my wife. Well, I don't know your wife. Oh, I think you do. <laughs> I said, who's your wife? Jerry Taylor, she produces Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh -huh. Does this tell you how small Hollywood is? No. This is in one night. So now I'm on cloud nine. Mm. I'm meeting all these cool people who are all connected in a way I never dreamed. And Bob Conrad didn't show up and I was still mad about that. So we went back to the hotel after dinner. We drove up to Anaheim and got a hotel room there because the guy said, let's go to Disney, that'll make everybody feel better. 
so we stayed in Anaheim, and I, as when we got into the hotel room, I said to the guys, you know, I've got Conrad's number. Should I call him? Should I should I chance it and call him? And they were like, you flew out here to meet him. Why didn't you call him? The worst that he could do was hang up on you. So I didn't have a cell phone in those days, picked up the phone and I called his number and he answered the phone and I said, I said, Bob? He said, yes. I said, this is James Conley from New York. And he said, oh my God. I'm so sorry, I forgot you were coming. He said, that I bleep, made me so mad. I completely forgot that you were coming. And I said, well, what happened? He said, you know, when I was doing the show, the stuntmen and I were like a family. We were a team. They were my guys and I was their guy and we did everything together and we, we, we built that show. We did all those stunts ourselves and she wouldn't let the stuntmen come to the reunion because they were actors or writers. So he said, look, you won't let them come. If it's not good enough for them, I'm not coming either. I said, oh man, I'm sorry. He says, hey man, what are you doing tomorrow? Disney. <laughs> if, 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 if you want to, if you're cool with it, why don't you drive up to my house? Yep. I'm cool with that. <laughs> it's a little bit of a drive, James. Okay, okay how far, Bob? Uh, five hours from LA. I'm up in Bear Valley. Okay. <laughs> Rental car, no problem. So everybody was game. We all loaded the car and we drove five hours to his private community in Bear Valley, California. And Bob Conrad came out and we had lunch with him and he put the jacket back on that I gave him, oh, took so pictures with him, had a great, great time, and listened to him for about two hours talking about playing football in Hollywood in the 1960s with Elvis and Red West and Gary Lockwood, and how they would pick each other up and tackle each other and do all of this stuff when they weren't supposed to have their faces injured and all this stuff. <laughs> Best time of my life listening to these people, and it all connected back to this crazy little Twilight Zone town. <laughs> it's weird. So that was that. <laughs> these fan films, and when I started to do that, I said, you know what? Uh, Everybody knows the Enterprise. They know what it looks like. So if I don't get that right, they're not going to take me seriously at all. And they're going to laugh worse than they would laugh otherwise. So I really wanted to look good. And it was uh, uh, my drive for detail, I think, that made everybody curious about those things and want, want to watch them. And so that's how I got into this, this set thing. I would come home from doing my, my thing as Elvis, and I would go uh, to my grandfather's house he was uh, like an amateur carpenter. You know, he did all his own home improvement stuff. And we would go out into his workshop and we would build the Enterprise. And that's how it started. Yeah. Just because I wanted to play Captain Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Yeah. The guys that, that helped me with the fan films, and we still talk about that to, to this day. I mean, how funny is it that we're building a wooden starship for Elvis? <laughs> you still do it. Somebody, I just saw somebody somewhere. Let me get you, I think I missed you. Uh, so out of curiosity, about speaking of the fan films, um, are there any uh, episodes that are still out there that you haven't released yet? Or there are, and you haven't released yet? Th that is a sticky situation. <laughs> here's, this, here's the thing, we filmed an episode called Bread and Savagery, which was a, a sequel to uh, Bread and circuses. Mm -hmm. And we didn't get all of the footage because the director uh, had some serious health problems while we were shooting. And, and before we could bring him back to get the pieces that we needed, he passed away. Mm -hmm. So we set that aside. Then we all came back, you gotta help me with my memory, Z. We all came back and we shot, uh, is it Mind Center? So we did Mind Sifter, and at that point I had step, stepped back from uh, playing Captain Kirk, and Brian Gross came in to play Captain Kirk. And we did Mind Sifter, and it was, it was a good episode. I thought it great. I, I like it, and I think Brian brought some depth to that that I probably didn't have the skill to do. And, and it was a good shoot. And then we did um, 
Torment of Destiny with Richard Hatch playing the bad guy, and we went back to Yonata with Natura. And that whole episode was shot. And while we were uh, winding into the, the post-production part of that whole thing, uh, the whole Axonar uh, debacle, fiasco uh, happened. Uh, and we had warned uh, that gentleman about all this, that what he was doing was going to ultimately stop other fans from being able to enjoy their hobby and their passion. But he really didn't want to hear that and uh, went about doing what he was doing. So that uh, brought CBS to start a lawsuit against him and then they, they created guidelines so that other fans would know what the parameters were. And in the guidelines, now these aren't laws, by the way, these are guidelines. But, but, in the guidelines it says if you have worked on real Star Trek, or if you are an official licensee, you can't work on fan films. Um. Okay, so these are suggestions from CBS because they don't want you, the fans making the movies, running afoul and getting in trouble with copyrights. And it's trying to protect the fans is what it's trying to do. It's not trying to slap my wrists. But I fall into that category because I, I am a current licensee and I've worked on the show, mm. right? So I, I could violate that guideline and release an episode, but I have morals and values. And thank you. I have always believed that the people that own Star Trek, whether it was Desilu and then Paramount and then and then Paramount and CBS and CBS and Viacom. I've always believed that those people are Star Trek. It's their property. And so I never, I loved Star Trek enough, there goes that phone again. Mm -hmm. I loved Star Trek enough that I never wanted Star Trek mad at me. So if they say, we don't want you to do this, then I don't do it. And when I was making the voyages, if we did something that aroused uh, them to send an email to say, hey, we don't like your advertising, you know, for your next episode. It says this, could you change it so that it reads this way? I always immediately did it. I never said no, I, you know, hey guys, you own it. If that's what you want, that's the way it is. Whereas the guys at Axonar were like, no, I'm not gonna do that. Yeah. <laughs> we don't own Star Trek, we love it, but we don't own it. And we have to respect the people that do own it. And I know there's a lot of different thought processes, but it's like your car, right? You don't want people treating your car badly if you, if you let somebody borrow it. And that's kind of what I, I, I think of with Star Trek. If, if they're gracious enough to let me make my own little fan movie, then I should abide by what they want me to do. And now that I'm in a different place in life, if they say, look, you worked on the show, we don't want you getting involved with fan films and uh, running this running stuff and, and potentially having issues, well, then I'm not gonna do it. That, that's simple. Uh, so the answer is I'm not involved there. You know, I can't release anything. I don't want to release anything. That was a part of my past. We, fortunately, I was smart enough to see the end of the fan film era that I was part of. And I was smart enough to call CBS and say, hey, I built this thing, this huge thing that I think is pretty special. And the thing that I love about it the most is being able to share it with my friends and other people and meeting new friends. What would you think if we opened it up as a tour, like a real movie studio? And CBS said, you know, that's an interesting idea. They didn't say no. Mm. And so a couple of months later, they sent me an email and they said, yes, let's do this. Nice. And I think it's because we always respected what they wanted. And they saw the value of what we built physically. And they understood that my passion was meeting all of you. It's more fun doing this than it is making a movie for 14 or 15 hours a day. So that's why the, the tour is here, because of the guidelines. You were in Star Trek 2009. Yes, sir. It was a it was a uh, um, complete accident. We had just finished filming uh, the New Voyages episode, World Enough in Time, with George Takei, 
And the guy that directed that, uh, his name was Mark Zikri. Mark has written some great scripts over the years for different television shows like Deep Space Nine and Sliders. He's kind of a quirky guy and sometimes hard to take, but very talented writer. Don't get me wrong, very, that's where his talent lies, his writing. He also wrote The Twilight Zone Companion, the book. Mm. So he and Michael Reeves wrote this Sulu story and we, we filmed it with George. And it went on the internet and it just exploded. People loved it. We got a call from Paramount Pictures. This is the closest we ever got. I think the closest any fan film ever got to legitimacy. Excuse me. The closest we ever got to legitimacy was uh, we got a call from Paramount Pictures Home Video. And the gentleman's name was Malik Ducard. And he said, hey, James, how are you? I'm Malik from Paramount. And then I first I thought I was in trouble. And he said, um, I want to ask you a question. And I said, sure, what is it? And he said, I want to know why Paramount Home Video hasn't released World Enough in Time on Home Video. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I want to have a meeting. Could you and Mark Sacre come to the studio in Hollywood so that we can talk about releasing World Enough in Time on Home Video? We were stunned. So I got on a plane and flew to California to have this meeting on the studio, which just so happened to be at the time that they were filming the new J.J. Abrams movie. And the Abrams movie was shrouded in secrecy. You guys remember, there wasn't much coming out and there was pictures of actors wearing raincoats to hide their costumes and all this kind of stuff. So when I landed in California, a very, very dear friend of mine who was a stunt woman on Deep Space Nine, her name was Leslie Hoffman, picked me up at the airport and we drove over to the studio together. And I had my son with me, and we were supposed to meet Mark Zakri on the lot. And we got on the lot, and Mark uh, called us and said that he was going to be late. And to tell Mr. Ducard to start the meeting, he would get there as soon as he possibly could. I hope this isn't an emergency. Hang on. <laughs> I will be there as soon as possible. Oh. Okay. Uh, I'm on stage. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's a New York State senator at the studio. Uh, no. <laughs> That's whatever. A political asshole, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a king. Come on. <laughs> anyway, yes. so we're on the lot, and my son says, "Hey, they're filming that that new Star Trek movie." You know your way around. Why don't we go over there and watch? Why don't we see what's going on? And I'm like, no, we're going to get in trouble. We could get thrown off the lot. We need to go to the meeting and do our thing and behave ourselves. So then the, my friend, the stunt woman, Leslie, says, James, come on. We can walk by there. We know how to do it. We can blend in. Mm -hmm. We can walk by stage eight and nine and just casually. They're not going to stop us. We're on the lot already. And you know, she was right. If you're on the lot, you have permission to be on the lot. As long as you're not doing something stupid, people don't bother you. So I finally relented and I said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna walk over to the commissary. Let's get something to drink. And then we're gonna walk around the block. We're gonna go through the alley between stages eight and nine, come up between the two sound stages and go past stage nine, right in front of them. So the first thing that happens is we go into the commissary to get our, our drinks. And John Cho, who played Sulu, comes hustling into the commissary with his rain jacket suit. <laughs> and my son Patrick says, that's Mr. Sulu. <laughs> so we're watching, we wait, and when he turns around, he's right in our face, and I put my hand out to him, and I said, Mr. Cho, congrat congratulations, we're big Star Trek fans. You know, we're excited about the movie. Just wanted to say hello. And he shook my hand, but he acted like I had leprosy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's because he was scared about things from the, from the office saying, don't do this, don't do I had no idea if he was really like or a standoffish kind of thing. So we didn't do anything more than we left. He took off with his drink. We waited a few minutes, and then we headed over towards stages eight and nine. I had bad timing, or good timing. To we got over there. We came out between the alley, we took a right turn, and we were right in front of the huge bay doors for stage nine. And as we were, 
God is my witness. As we were walking in front of the doors, the little, the little office door opened and J.J. Abrams walked out with a couple of people. And he looked at me and I looked at him and I kept walking and my son goes, that's J.J. Abrams, that's J.J. I said, no, shut up, come on. <laughs> and he said, say something, say something. So I stopped and I, and I turned and as I turned, J.J. was getting into a golf cart and he stopped and he stood up and he said, James Cawley? <gasps> Oh! <laughs> now I was scared. <laughs> I didn't realize that he and all the actors had been watching World Enough in Time with George Takei. He walked over to me and he put his hand out and he said, What are you doing here? I didn't know you were going to be here. Nobody told me you were on a lot. And I said, Oh, I'm not here for this. Mm -hmm. And I explained to him where I was going in the meeting that I was having. And he shook my hand and he wished me luck. And he said, listen, when you're done, come back over to the stage and be my guest. And I'll take you in and you can watch the filming and see the Enterprise. <laughs> yes. <Really? laughs> Absolutely. So we go over, we go through the whole meeting. And the meeting is fairly productive. And it's, you know, kind of boring. But we get out of the meeting and we go back. And uh, I can't remember the gal's name. She was his assistant, JJ's, she was terrific. She met us outside and she took us upstairs to the offices and we had to sign NDAs, mm -hmm. you know, sign your life away. And we went into the sound stage. Now I'd been in this sound stage before when Next Generation shot there. So I was shocked to get in there and it was empty and cavernous. There was one set in this huge building, one set. You just see the one from behind. And she said, just wait right here. Uh, he's finishing a, a setup for a shot, and JJ will be down to get you. So we waited a few minutes. And finally, JJ came down, and he was so warm, and just this, this genuine guy. He was it's like talking to any one of you guys on the street. And he said, hey, man, you want to see the bridge? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so he walked us uh, through, right through the middle of the main view screen. The bottom of it was pulled out, and they walked us under the bridge. And I stood there and I was, I must have looked like I'd been kicked in the privates <laughs> with the expression that I had. And he was kind of like a kid, he was like bouncing on his heels. He said, what do you think of the bridge? What do you think of the bridge? And then he looked at me and he goes, oh, you don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh no, don't. I said, please do not, do not get me wrong. I said, it is a beautiful set, it's gorgeous, but it's just not the enterprise to me. Mm. And he looked at me and he put his arm around my shoulders and he said, coming from you, I totally understand. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I want your help. I said, you want my help? So now I'm thinking, why is he, if he doesn't want my help, he's just trying to make me happy. And he says, no, no, I really, I want your help, so come over here. So he walks me around this bank of TV monitors and he puts me in the director's chair. So I've got all his monitors and he's standing next to me. And he leans over to the assistant director and he says, okay, quiet him down and get him ready. He's quiet all the actors down. So Chris Pine is there and John Cho is at the helm and Anton's at this side and Zoe's mm -hmm. over here. They're all talking. They start to quiet down. And John Cho turns around at the helm to look at James <laughs> and I'm sitting in the director. <laughs> You can see the color in his face. <laughs> oh, what have I done? I can only get him not to laugh. So he sat there, and JJ said, we're going we're, we're to do this shot, and I want your opinion on the shot. It's important to me. You're a fan of the show. I want your opinion. And I could not wrap my mind around what he was doing. And they had this huge robotic arm with the camera on it, and it was outside the main view screen, and it was computer controlled. And Chris Pine sat down in the captain's chair, it was a real dramatic moment, and he sat down in the captain's chair and said, punch it. And the computer controlled camera zoomed right in on his face, and they put a band of light right across his eyes like they used to do with William Shatner. Mm. And that's what JJ wanted me to see. And I loved it. I, I said, that's, that's Star Trek, that's the classic Star Trek. He said, yeah, that's what I wanted your opinion. And for some reason it wasn't in the movie. Yeah. That, that light was not no. in the movie. But anyway, we were there, we watched him film for about an hour. 
and he introduced us to the entire cast. And we met Carl Urban first, and he said, man, you're the internet guy. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Dr. McCoy, so I've even got the pinky ring. And he showed us his ring, and he's, he's quoting the episodes. And, uh, Zachary Pinto was this very soft-spoken guy. Was, the, the cast were amazing people. Now, at this point, I still have not been introduced to Chris Pine. I haven't met him yet. He wasn't, he'd gone off the set. So I said to JJ, can I possibly meet Chris Pine? He said, oh, he'll be back shortly, absolutely. He said, that's got to happen. So we waited. When he finally came back, and they were rehearsing the, the scene where he and Spock get into a fight. You guys remember that? Mm -hmm. And they were, he was rehearsing for stuff, man. Uh, they finished, and JJ said, Chris, come over here. And he came over, and he said, uh, Chris, I'd like you to meet James Cawley. And Chris Pine goes, damn, you're the internet, Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had this great conversation, and I had a copy of, of the script for Star Trek The Motion Picture with me in a binder. And he, he said, I, I, let me see the cover, I wanna, I'll give you an autograph. You, and I said, would you please? He said, sure. And so he wrote on it, he said, uh, from one Captain Kirk to another, I can't wait for the day until the triad is complete and we stand with Bill Shatner. Best wishes, Chris Pond. It was amazing, it was just great. So I was there for a few hours and I looked at my friend Leslie, who was supposed to go to dinner with some of the friends. And it was getting late, later and later. And I finally went over to JJ and I said, JJ, thanks so much for this. Uh, what a wonderful gift, what a great day. Uh, we've, we've got to be going, I got to, I, we have dinner plans, and she's my ride. He said, well, you're leaving? I said, yeah, and I, 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 you know, I flew 3,000 miles, and you know, we had other plans, and I can't you know, just diss these people. And he said, no, I get it, I get it, but can, can you wait here a few more minutes? And I said, sure. And then he left. About five minutes later, he came back with this gal, and they walked up to me, and she was walking her all around me, and so on and so forth. And he said, what do you think? And she said, oh, he's, he's perfect. Uh. <laughs> First time I've ever heard that. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I said, uh, is, there, is there a problem? He said, no, no. Is this a, uh, any chance you can come back at 5 in the morning? I said, 5 in the morning? He said, 5 in the morning. He said, James, you're in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> What? Yeah, man, you're in the movie. I want you in the movie. She's looking you over for a Starfleet uniform. And I looked at my friend Les and I said, can I be here at 5 o'clock in the morning? She says, James, you're going to be here at 5 o'clock. <laughs> so we came back and uh, I had breakfast and wardrobe and hair and all that stuff. And they combed my hair and JJ came in and he said, can we cut your hair? So you can do whatever you want. You know? <laughs> so they cut my hair, did all this stuff, and they... Uh, they, they took the black out of it, so it's my more natural hair color. And uh, I spent three days on the set. They, they got me into the union, they got me into SAG. Wow. They paid me. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, I got to be on the Enterprise. And then when the, when the movie, when I had to leave, my three days were, were up, I had to leave California, I had to go back home. Uh, JJ said um, to the girl, Put that uniform in a box, wrap it in plastic, and write his name on it. When we when we wrap production, you're gonna get your uniform. Oh. And true to his word, he mailed me that uniform. Wow. That uniform. Wow. So that's right. I think he was an amazing guy. And uh, another quick funny part of that, two years later, um, I got an email from him out of the blue, and I thought, well, what is this? And he's like, hey, man, where are you? I'll send you whatever you need to get you home. What? <laughs> so I scrolled down, and it was one of those scam oh, uh, chain yeah. letters. I'm stuck in Brazil. Yeah. Oh, Somebody uh, spoofed my email. I still have this thing. They spoofed my email, and JJ was in my my mail, my, oh. my email, and it went to his inbox. And he thought that I was stranded somewhere, and he was going to send me the money to get me home. Oh. What does that tell you about your yes. <laughs> So he falls for us. Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you like the films or not, 
What a terrific group of people they were to, to do what they did. I'm sorry, was that? He did. I went back to California three months later, I think, and it was the last day of shooting, and I didn't know this. Thanks for reminding me, Tom. I went back, and it was the last day of shooting on the film, and I was driving down the freeway, down the 405, and uh, my cell phone rang, and it was his assistant, and she said, hey, J.J. Uh, Abrams would like you to come back to the studio for the last day of shooting, which is today. And I said, well, how did he know I was in California? And she said, he didn't. Are you in California? Said, no, <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, then you have to come over to the studio. Well, today's the last day of filming, and J.J. would like you to come over if you could. History of the Future Museum. Oh, uh, no. Mm. I think a lot of them were destroyed. Um, yeah, except for the original ones that went into the uh, to the archive. But anyway, to finish what Tony reminded me of, I was there for the last day of shooting, and Anton Yelchin had not met Walter Koenig yet. Oh. They hadn't met him. So JJ said to me, James, you know Walter, can you get him on the phone? So I called Walter and said, Walter, uh, Anton Yelchin, Yelchin wants to meet you, and J.J. Abrams wants you to come to the studio. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm at Paramount. He said, you're kidding. I said, no, they want you to come over. So they're going to leave a pass at the gate. So Walter came over, and when he got to the gate, I was out there with a lady that ran his fan club, and he couldn't get through the guards. They didn't have his pass yet. They didn't know who he was. And I said to the guard, you've got to let him in. That's Chekhov from Star Trek. <laughs> so the guard said, oh. Okay. <laughs> so Walter got out of his car and he yep. said, Jesus Christ. <laughs> you have more pull around here than I do. <laughs> it was a great moment. Walter, Walter was a great guy. And so Walter went on the set and he had a great visit with, with Anton. It was really sentimental to see the passing of the torch. Uh, and the next, uh, that later that afternoon, I said to JJ, when I was saying my goodbyes, I said that I was in LA because we were screening World Enough in Time at a theater for the crew. And he said, oh, then your whole crew's in town? I said, yeah. He says, I'll tell you what, bring them all to Paramount tomorrow and I will buy the studio tour for your crew. And he did. Wow. So he bought the entire New Voyages cast and crew the Paramount studio tour. So that's more J.J. Abrams. So thanks for reminding me of that. Really, the snowball happens, right? So all these guys that felt the same way I did said, "Well, you know, I know how to do this, and I can paint, and I can, I know how to do lighting, and I know." And that's the real story. It's not just me. It's it's everybody that, that loved it, like you guys. It, it's we're not celebrities, and that that's the thing that upsets me too. Fan films are fan films. These are fans supposedly enjoying themselves, right? <laughs> We don't think, most of us anyway, don't think we're the second coming of William Shatner. Okay. I can't speak for the others, but for me, it was about recapturing that, that childhood love of something. And I think it was for 90% of my crew, you know, that, that did what we did. I think I can safely say that. And believe me, there's ups and downs and attitudes and all this stuff that happens because everybody has a sense of, I know how to do it, and you don't quite know how to do it. So that's the thing that you overcome in show business. There's the show, which is awesome, and there's the business, which is really tough, whether it's doing Elvis or whatever. But there's young people in the audience. How many people are in their, their 20s and 30s in this audience, right? Or younger? Mm -hmm. Okay. I just turned 54. So I want to give you a piece of quick advice. And I don't care where you are in life, and I don't care what you're doing. And if it didn't start when you were younger, it's not too late. You need to remember the most important words that my parents, unfortunately, could not say to me because it was a different world. There is nothing you cannot do if you want it bad enough. There is nothing you cannot have if you don't want to go out and get it and work for it. If you want to do something, you can do it. 
Don't let anybody tell you you can't. Can't has never been in my vocabulary. You have to throw that away. You, only you can make yourself happy. Mm. My father did say to me before he passed away at a young age, if you find a job that you really love, you'll work, but you will never really work a day in your life mm. because you'll love what you're doing. So by all means, find something that you love, and if there's a wall, knock it down. If there's a fence, climb over it. Don't let anybody tell you no. Don't, because you'll never be more happy unless you're doing what you want to do. If you're doing something that you don't really like, well, that's not living. I mean, sometimes out of necessity, you start here, yeah. and you don't like it to get yourself here, but you never lose sight of what it is you want to do. So if you're at that point in your life, and you're questioning yourself, find out what it is that you love, and get there. Because guess what? I'm 54, which doesn't seem old to some people, but when you're in your 20s, you don't think of, you think of 54 as old, and then you get to 50 and you're like, Jesus, I'm 50. <laughs> where, where did that time go? Right? It goes by fast, faster than you realize. So make yourself happy, and then you can make other people happy. And that's the way to do it, and that's how we get to Gene Roddenberry's world. Right there. That's the easy way, right? If everybody's happy and we're lifting each other up, hell, we've had a good day. I'm having a good day. I think Shatner's on his way. I've got to go see a politician. Uh, <laughs> yeah, imagine that. Anyway, God bless you guys. Uh, I don't know where we're at time. You're going to play that movie a little bit too, aren't you? You're going to try. So they're going to play some of Bill's movie for you. I'm going to be wandering around. I'll be at the studio. I'll be at dinner tonight. Uh, i got to do something with this for God's sake. <laughs> God bless you guys. Thank you. <laughs>